Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight at our lecture series. Um, we are very excited to have Christoph Kampusch join us and present material on his new book. And uh, I'd just like to start by saying that um, to thank the Dean Maria Perbellini for making these events happen. Um, the, the lecture series is very important to our school and we feel that the students and the faculty benefit very much from these stimulating discussions. Um, so I would like to talk uh, two minutes about uh, Christoph's trajectory and uh, I met Christoph um, at an event, a lecture event of Kenneth Frampton last year and we had a very long discussion about the importance of details in architecture and their relevance and how we represent them and whether they're disappearing, whether their role takes on a larger role in the way we create parts to whole and the way we appreciate aesthetics today. Uh, it opens up a very large question um, in terms of where we're going in the future and um, Christoph will, will be sharing with us his insights on how he created this body of work. Christophe is a New York-based architect and a Core One coordinator at Columbia University, GSAP, where he teaches design and visual studies is, and is the director of Columbia's brand new Extraction lab, Laboratory. He is the director of Forward Slash, a multidisciplinary practice founded in 2008, and the head of Backslash, an experimental arm of Forward Slash, investigating technology and material effects on form and tectonics. It grounds his work in a concentrated research program focused on architectural details and the spawning of new buildings from the smallest parts outward. A theoretical project runs parallel to this work, identifying historical and cultural contexts triggered by detail innovation. The office is both a design and publishing outfit, producing essays, books, exhibitions, installations, podcasts, performances, films, and buildings. Forward Slash strives to be intellectually rigorous, material sustainable, and socially responsible. Christoph Kampusch was Leonardo da Vinci Fellow and a Rudolf M. Schindler Scholar, MAK Center Architect in Residence, USAA Scholar, National Collegiate Engineering Award winning winner at, um, and a 2013 and 2015 Graham Foundation grantee. Kampusch is co-author of System Vein, with Lebis Woods, Anthony Vidler, and Manuel Delanda in 2005, editor of Idea, Autopsy, um, Pavilion, uh, sorry, <laughs> Idea Autopsy, you'll probably say that much better in German than I would, Pavilion, uh, published by Lars Müller Publishers in 2013, Urban Hopes, Made in China, but also by Lars Müller in 2014, and his most recent publication that I'll speak to you about tonight, Detail Culture, If Buildings Had DNA, published last uh, 2016. Kampusch had previously taught at Cornell University's AAP, Cooper Union's Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture, Ohio State University, and at SciArc. He has been invited juror at Harvard University, Yale University, the Architectural Association in London, Bartlett and Greenwich University, and the École Nationale Supérieure d'Architecture in Marseille. In 2010, Campuche co-founded the Institute of Mutating Cities with Yuma Chala, Chalala. Yeah. <laughs> 2012, Campuche completed his PhD on Detail Culture if Buildings Had DNA, Case Studies of Mutations at the Universität für Angewandte Kunst in Vienna. Recent projects include an elephant playground and water pa park in Patong, Thailand, an East Village think tank, a co-working space in Shoredik, London, and a feasibility study for a theater in Havana, Cuba. The Light Pavilion by Stephen Hall Architects at the Sliced Porosity Block in Chengdu, China, was one of several projects spanning a decade of collaboration with Lebes Woods was recently completed. Forward Slash was the winner of an international competition to build the first ever hub and theater space for Performa 15, a world-renowned venue for performing arts in New York's Tribeca, and is currently working on a proposal for a temple in Black Rock Desert. So Christophe will take us to many places today. Um, I'd like to welcome our guests, so if you would please silence your mobile devices, we shall continue with our show. Thank you very much. OK. 
Can we have it completely dark? Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, this is midterm week and um, uh, a kind of like project final um, marathon. So I really appreciate uh, whoever made it out and down to uh, 60th uh, Street. I uh, have a relatively um, ambitious program planned in terms of what I would like to um, go through uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, leading up and then also leading back out of uh, detail culture again. Can we lower the lights more? Um, it's just like the films are gonna be um, way more uh, vivid uh, if, if possible. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, um, detail culture as a kind of like encyclopedia or uh, compendium of uh, architectural details as they um, interact and fit into both the public but then also the built uh, environment. The book itself um, started as an ambition uh, 2012, uh, was a five-year project uh, with uh, um, all original um, works and drawings in terms of like me wanting to create um, a dictionary uh, or encyclopedia of sorts where uh, anybody or everybody interested in architecture could uh, kind of like go in, uh, open it, think about um, 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 things that we deal with as architects, uh, as conditions, like how do you do a corner, how do you do a roof, how do you deal with fenestrations, how do you deal with uh, um, stairs, transitions, uh, what uh, is a good way of starting a project, how do I end a project, how do I deal with roofs, uh, roof lines and horizons and um, look at very, very short or a very, very small amount of projects. In fact, 12 plus one only. Those were all chosen not in order for me to make a point on them being representative uh, of uh, a very particular genre or a very particular time in, in, in uh, uh, history, but they are projects that uh, have been built within the last 15 years and uh, were all born out of sites that I um, either worked at or projects I was um, involved with uh, the one way or other with the one exception being the Light Pavilion, which was uh, a project Lebius Woods and I um, collaborated on for like um, um, seven years. So that's kind of like that one that, that I kind of like show uh, in, in uh, detail. Um, the book also, as you can, as you can see or, or, or tell, uh, um, was uh, um, published in uh, or thought of in a variety of different languages. Uh, it's uh, come out in uh, Chinese uh, um, um, so far, which was very, very important because it uh, helped us to um, publish, produce, and uh, print um, a compendium of a book that like wouldn't have had it that easy in order to hit it uh, or hit the market uh, the one way or other. Um, what I mean by that, it is uh, trying to be as affordable as possible and accessible as possible for uh, anybody interested in uh, um, um, details. The book is intentionally not organized um, um, project by project, but it's organized um, um, in uh, categories. So you would look at it, uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, as uh, um, something where you say I'm interested in, for example, a corner detail. You go into a corner chapter and you have 120, 125 uh, different details, all in the same scale, all using the same graphic standards, uh, line weights, uh, and so on, um, that then allow you to look at the detail rather than like the project itself. So it uh, dematerializes uh, that particular um, condition. The detail has fallen into a cyclical misunderstanding within conceptual and technical spectrums known as architecture. Um, detail culture tries to settle that mistake through uh, an investigative matrix, case studies, scale drawings, interviews, and analytical texts claiming yet again the fundamental importance of the detail. Three challenges I um, uh, looked at throughout, uh, which were architectural details are typically communicated through technical drawings. Um, a photograph or a model might convey details in context or the ultimate visual generated uh, notion of how do I look at the detail through drawings, but also through a series of uh, interviews that like went right to uh, um, the DNA of a project. Uh, this is a, a, a kind of conversation with Kazuyo Sejima uh, speaking about like what does it mean to create an invisible corner. There were similar ones um, that uh, just pointing at Saha, for example, that uh, we're addressing the question of, well, how do you produce uh, a liquid uh, or fluid corner rather than a sharp corner? Those are um, um, spread out through uh, the book, trying to look deeper into 
um, um, the making of a building rather than uh, how buildings are usually represented, uh, which is through uh, sleek renderings, photographs, if we don't have the chance to, uh, in fact, like visit them on site. So this is kind of like trying to take a kind of like counter position to it and uh, look at uh, the making of architecture, the making of uh, a building, um, and the making uh, through, uh, or the inventing uh, of a building uh, through uh, details. Um, the one spread I have on the, on the, um, um, a screen is uh, Peter Cook and Colleen Fonier's uh, project that uh um, uh, looks at, uh, well, how do I deal with amorphic shapes? Like, how do I deal with uh, questions of uh, creating uh, a roof uh, through both high-tech and low-tech uh, modes? Um, Peter Cook always calls this kind of like, not low-tech, but cracked tech, uh, where he uh, invented a kind of like screening system, like uh, a very low-res pixel system, if you uh, wish, that allows to uh, interact with uh, videographers, uh, um, conceptual artists, and so on and so forth through an almost like non-existing budget. Uh, this is uh, the rain screen, as you uh, may be able to tell, the kind of like cladding on top of it. And those are things that you would find in like um, um, bathroom light fixtures, right? It's just like the LED uh, uh, fluorescent um, 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 light rings that can be programmed and uh, um, uh, uh, become part of that, part of that uh, message uh, that can be sent or um, not. Um, a couple other interviews. The projects that are represented throughout um, the book uh, range uh, widely in terms of uh, building methodology from concrete to steel to wood construction. Uh, this is a spread looking at the geometry of Saha Edith's Guangzhou uh, Opera House. This is a concrete um, uh, um, uh, building uh, called De Broad by uh, uh, Charles Renfro, Liz Stiller, and uh, Ricardo Scofidio in Los Angeles downtown. Uh, one of the kind of like uh, newer um, um, contributions to, to art deposits. Uh, um, it's a facade designed in uh, Germany that we then like uh, dissect throughout the book. This is one of the very few um, um, BIM uh, models that are represented. A lot of them, as I mentioned earlier, um, look very, very comparable. Uh, a lot of the details, uh, they are as, as uh, I think having uh, said that they're all redrawn in scale one to 10, there's a graphic scale of 30 centimeters. Um, all uh, materials are represented the same way. Um, uh, insulation is like drawn the same way. Concrete is represented the same way. So if you look at, or if you imagine uh, projects uh, as widely different stylistically, architecturally, but then also formally, like uh, Saha Hadid, Kame Pinos, Stephen Hall here in uh, Guangzhou, China, they also, of course, draw differently and, and, and represent architecture differently, uh, which not only has to do with modes of representation, but also uh, kind of a cultural understanding of like how, how uh, to build and how to actually um, build something in, 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 in uh, uh, very, very uh, simple ways uh, in oftentimes very complex uh, uh, terms. So the kind of like the graphic standards uh, try to um, um, equalize uh, some of those modes. Um, there's projects that are uh, complex in terms of materiality, some that are uh, simple. This is low-tech, uh, New York-based uh, office, uh, Atatola and uh, Giuseppe Lignano, um, really close friends and colleagues uh, um, up at Columbia. I haven't really known them at uh, uh, that time, but uh, a lot of people were also extremely kind of like um, um, supportive in trying to have their buildings being looked at through a lens that like becomes interesting to, you know, uh, upcoming architects, like uh, ingoing architects, like students, um, very much like referring to to uh, experiences my generation had at that time, looking at Ford's uh, details of modern architecture. This was really the one kind of like reference uh, that you uh, had. So uh, what detail culture also tries to decode is uh, modes of construction that kind of didn't really change all that much, even though technology changed quite a bit. Um, the Cooper Union building uh, was uh, about the same time I was uh, teaching there with uh, Lebius that the building started to kind of like uh, go up and it was very, very exciting to on almost like a weekly basis, basis visit uh, the site and, and, and with my students and kind of like really see the, the project uh, um, not only being formulated but kind of taking on shape and form. Um, it starts to look at uh, um, kind of things as, uh, well, what do modians do if they're not really structural but like spatial? Um, the project itself uh, um, looks at it through, uh, again, like yet the same uh, scale. There's projects that uh, try to kind of like demystify uh, construction a little bit. This is uh, my project in uh, Guangzhou uh, as part of the slice porosity block. Uh, 
It's like a, a kind of uh, multifaceted development. It's like, uh, like close to 5,000 like, uh, apartments, eight cinemas, a uh, couple of shopping uh, centers. It's a huge complex, uh, not really a building, uh, but developed uh, with uh, um, a developer, um, um, Singaporean developer called Raffles City, a uh, Stephen Hall project. And Stephen at that time uh, has invited, had invited Lebius to kind of uh, create a building within a building. There were like three um, architects, uh, him doing the history pavilion, Ai Weiwei, who is uh, um, um, creating a couple of really interesting installations throughout the city at the moment, did one called the Dufu Pavilion. Uh, and then uh, we were initially uh, planning to work on uh, what was called the Technology Pavilion uh, until uh, Lab became uh, very uninterested in, in uh, um, the naming and the kind of like the program of it uh, also very much being aware that technology changes and light being kind of universal and, and, and doesn't change. Um, we uh, look at or I look at the projects through uh, 10 different lenses. This is one that uh, highlights uh, um, um, the question of like the facade or what is called chassis geometry. Um, how do I deal with uh, um, um, facades and geometries uh, in the built environment? This is Kame Pinos in Guadalajara, Mexico. It's a project um, I, we were working next door at and also uh, living very, very close by. Um, it's very interesting to see Kame not only uh, creating uh, the first tower uh, with a courtyard, um, um, but then also um, um, a very, very, I think, unique way of how she dealt with uh, the facade. Um, the book has has uh, about 800 details, uh, uh, 1,024 pages, I, I, I believe. So it, it, it's, it's difficult to extract uh, uh, pages that kind of like are representative of uh, different chapters here, but it's an attempt to um, give you somehow uh, an overview. This is one of my favorite spreads. Uh, I kind of like just being the roadmap more or less in terms of like how to read uh, um, um, the book, how to go through it. There's always like explanatory sections and, and kind of like quotations that like anchor the project. Uh, um, there's key images that are uh, keyed into details. Each one of the details is um, organized uh, into lenses. There's a graphic scale. This kind of like is less and less relevant for uh, a kind of um, um, current generation of architects that uh, um, work very much within the just digital world. Uh, the kind of graphic scale is sometimes helpful in, in simply being very, very quickly uh, able to tell how big the things are. And I'm going to point this out uh, in a split second. And then the book itself, uh, if you have a chance to look at it outside, like please do, um, there's a couple of copies I brought. Um, there's tabs. So you could say, I'm just interested in like, um, um, I'm working with a problem called like uh, um, the facade. So you just like go into um, um, chassis geometry and you look at about 100 details of like facades. Or you say, you know what, that's interesting, but like I wanna know more about the Highline project. You can just like uh, look at the side of the book and uh, only dissect uh, projects that are concerned uh, with the high line. Each chapter is introduced through um, um, very, very quick essays, uh, historically, contextually, but then also um, um, conceptually, looking at uh, um, um, questions of each chapter, in that case, um, um, the corner. Um, now being in one of the chapters itself, uh, this is uh, Peter Sumtor and like his uh, Terme Valls in uh, Switzerland, um, looking at... Uh, um, things that are very, very difficult to um, see or understand if you just look at the building itself. What's interesting about this detail, it doesn't look all that spectacular in its first glance, is how it's dealing with uh, a building that very much wants to be uh, a stone building that is a very kind of uh, uh, interesting uh, um, um, sustainably positioned building, uses uh, Valsa quartzite, something that just comes two kilometers from uh, the path itself. But then if you really look at the construction, it, it very much takes uh, advantage of uh, uh, methodologies like uh, reinforced concrete that have very, very little to do with, in fact, uh, the way it is uh, um, um, looking, behaving, and positioning itself. Um, what I also like uh, to point out is that Sometimes uh, when details become very, very simple or very, very complex, uh, I'm adding uh, a quick uh, photo or a snapshot so it allows you to be immediately um, positioned. Those little pictograms with it's a bit hard to see, like the right circle up there, tell you where in the building you are. There's no, uh, as I mentioned earlier, project uh, uh, chapters, so it's very, very difficult to get an overview of like the building itself. Uh, but very much tries to be that attempt of uh, positioning a detail within each one of uh, those uh, pictograms. 
sometimes uh, I start to look at, uh, in that case, uh, the corner condition, but like one that uh, is positioned, as you see on the top, uh, in a wall to ceiling uh, notion. Uh, it indicates, again, through those red little errors, how do I, for example, have an open corner that also becomes uh, the kind of like skylight that washes uh, uh, um, this very, very um, diffuse light of the Alps uh, down into, into um, um, the bath itself. And then like to a certain degree also in one of the uh, details that uh, I will show later, like where are the drains, it's a bath, so there's a lot of like uh, water and a lot of like uh, water drippage. How is that being uh, dealt with? A very different building would be um, Raimund Abraham's uh, Musica House. It's a project in uh, Hamburg in Germany that is like a house for four musicians, kind of performing stage. But again, in that case, uh, looking at the floor to wall, wall to ceiling, corner condition, it's a project that like relies on uh, um, um, wood cladding yet again uh, within the context of like a concrete uh, structure. Um, if I go back two slides, you see that again, like reinforced concrete uh, is not only represented uh, in uh, a similar way, but you can also very quickly tell like how dimensions are changing and therefore like what uh, each member's uh, structural uh, responsibility is. There's another slide like looking kind of like further down at a very, very different corner. This is like a Sechima uh, project. That's again uh, the low-tech building, a very, very different uh, materiality being brought uh, to, to, to the table. It's like uh, um, their kind of uh, um, real fascination uh, and intelligent fascination with uh, um, um, recycling. Uh, this is a shipping container. A lot of uh, um, uh, Atta and Giuseppe's work uh, looks at modularity the one way or other. Um, they do not necessarily rely on just like uh, recycling, but the term that like Atta always calls upcycling. Uh, so they take something that's kind of disposed in an old shipping container and in that case became uh, a school for um, a visual and performing arts uh, in uh, Korea. Um, all of the photos in there are construction photos. There is no uh, final project photos. Uh, um, so it, it really allows to kind of like peel away uh, what usually uh, uh, presents itself as uh, um, either shiny or uh, rendered with the exception of in that case um, um, a photo that like is very, very close to the end of uh, the project that starts to look at um, color uh, the one way or other. I remember in one of the interviews, um, I asked Atter and um, Giuseppe what is their like most important uh, detail that uh, they think is most often forgotten. And uh, uh, I think Giuseppe's uh, very, very quick uh, answer was color. Uh, and uh, as you may or may not know, a lot of their projects are um, dealing with uh, um, the color yellow and like uh, very, very signaling um, uh, colors as part of a detailed understanding rather than like uh, the kind of like painting uh, of something. I just want to quickly point out uh, um, the Guangzhou uh, Opera House, a competition I was lucky enough to work on with uh, Kua Pimoblau at that time. Uh, we uh, thankfully lost. Uh, it was second um, uh, prize. Saha's office uh, uh, made the first one. It was a really, really... Uh, um, incredible win and incredible project uh, on many, many different like levels and would be way too long to go into it. But it brought a lot of like, um, like different methodologies in terms of like how things were built at that time in, in Guangzhou and uh, um, Guangdong. I happened to uh, live very, very close by. So I, I saw like, um, I saw it kind of like come out of the ground if you wish so. But like what I do want to point out here is remember the graphic scale, like the 30 centimeters, a little bit less than a foot, um, about two feet uh, from inches. So you see that like this whole thing would be almost like two and a half feet uh, um, 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 in terms of its dimensionality being uh, only the primary, uh, one of the many primary structural members of that whole uh, project. Uh, the facade itself is like um, um, easily carved uh, uh, stone panels. Um, for those of you who are like struggling with construction documents in your third years right now, those are um, the rain drains that sit behind the facades. It's a very, very smooth uh, type of like uh, um, appearance or body. You see this a little bit better here, but all of those uh, fugues or gaps or joints, there's a chapter called joints, they are open, as you can see uh, here, in order to let uh, water in and like the facade itself becomes the rain drain. This is like the same detail um, that now looks at the inside of that uh, particular uh, body. If you uh, orient yourself quickly here, and you see one of the kind of opera spaces um, um, in the smaller one, and this is the larger kind of auditorium, and it's kind of like final 
um, facade. A very different detail culture or uh, kind of like culture uh, applied to a project uh, not so far from here, 23rd Street, Neil Denaris, High Line 23. It was really the first building on the High Line. Uh, there was uh, um, a second one um, going up across the street. <laughs> to be fair enough, this was also um, um, happening uh, during the financial crisis. So like the building activity kind of slowed quite a bit. The project has a very interesting history in terms of like how it uh, came into being. Uh, the uh, owner, landowner, developer is the same person that uh, with uh, his partner that developed uh, the Jean Nouvel uh, project uh, on the West Side uh, Highway. So there was uh, um, um, uh, the possibility of like trading um, um, air rights, but the site itself was a two-story liquor store. It was a kind of uh, one cab was parked there, and then it was like a like a two-car garage, um, and uh, it became available. And uh, the kind of like the program brief was to build uh, a ten-story uh, high-rise. And like I remember um, Neil, but then also the developer gave a very very nice um, 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 talk with us not that long ago, um, saying that kind of like really made the project happen. Uh, in order to we also. Um, for whatever reason, um, 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 feasible. Um, this is a very different uh, type of uh, detail. Yet again, if you look at uh, a, kind of, uh, a kind of corner condition as it meets the facade with all of this, like different apartments, right? Like the 12th floor, the 13th, uh, a kind of floating glass facade, like uh, the beams being set back. You all see that those things are uh, um, kind of like a doppelganger of like the structure itself, but then they also become part of like a new ornamentic. It's printed onto the glass. Um, very, very interesting in order to be uh, uh, visible. The project itself, as in a lot of Neil's uh, uh, work, if I may so is, say, is uh, um, 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 I'm dealing with uh, the kind of like graphic representation, the mask, as uh, uh, Hedok would have uh, probably called it. Uh, but he was always afraid that if people put their um, shades down, like the structure is kind of painted away. So they painted the structure onto uh, the surface. And uh, if you may remember, kind of caused uh, quite a bonfire and revolution in like all kinds of theoretical circles in New York in terms of like you can't really paint the structure onto uh, a facade. But uh, that will be, again, a different conversation. This is Culver City and Eric Owen Moss's uh, Semi Tower Tower. It's a completely open structure, um, 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 four like round uh, um, floors, uh, kind of like presentation spaces, a, a kind of inhabitable billboard, if you wish so, uh, for the local communities in, in, in Culver City to uh, either perform, show their work, like um, um, screen some of their films, um, beautiful steel details. Uh, um, um, done in relatively uh, simple ways. If you look at it, just like the fasteners here and the kind of the exposure, and then those are just like projection screens. They're not really um, 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 uh, um, kind of facades in a classical uh, sense, uh, versus a very, very different project. In that case, again, looking at the sliced porosity block, um, I'm, I'm kind of like really questioning the way uh, one uh, enters into a building versus uh, a building uh, complex. Transitions, transformations uh, um, are uh, an interesting uh, a chapter all by itself, looking at things that we engage with but like are relatively unaware of, like stairs would be one of them, uh, ramps would be one of them, um, as kind of like both uh, uh, elements of circulation, elements of structure, but then also um, um, elements of uh, the kind of like inner gestalt of a project. That's Raymond Abraham again in, in Music House with this very, very beautiful um, 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 stainless polished uh, uh, steel uh, stair that uh, um, um, kind of like really grabs on to the uh, central circulation versus uh, um, uh, Sechima's project in Germany uh, again. It's a bubble deck construction, so a lot of like the a lot of the um, um, surfaces, a lot of uh, the kind of like structures uh, applied are uh, extremely diverse throughout. I think the book bubble deck is an interesting, um, in my opinion, interesting construction mode. If you want to have a very particular mass of like uh, reinforced concrete, but you don't uh, need or want uh, the weight, there's something uh, called bubble deck that like then. Uh, um, Light, lightens your structure, but uh, as you may see, it, it has uh, insulation um, completely absent other than uh, towards uh, kind of like deep barrier on the outside. The reason this was possible is it has a um, um, 
kind of injected heating and cooling system. Uh, um, it's a very interesting project because it uses uh, um, the hot water from like a nearby uh, coral that is constantly pumped through the project uh, that like heats it just enough throughout uh, the winter to kind of temperature control the project and like the flowing cold water through the concrete uh, allows for the temperature to drop uh, up to five degrees Celsius uh, throughout uh, the year. Um, again, if you look at, or if you remember the steel detail um, I just showed you in uh, Abraham's uh, project, very, very different uh, um, um, kind of like a staircase here in Atta and uh, Giuseppe's uh, project that very much like uh, deals with uh, railings, not so much as a kind of like structural conceptual element, but as an uh, architectural one that as you can probably see, doesn't uh, necessarily deal with uh, um, uh, safety concerns in a way that the project uh, in, for example, the Naris Highline uh, building in Manhattan is uh, dealing with. Chassis geometry looks at uh, um, geometric uh, strategies for projects that are formally very, very different. The Saha Adit uh, building, uh, of course, deals uh, architecturally with very, very different uh, questions than like uh, a Raymond Abraham or uh, a, a Nari or a Kame Binos uh, is doing, not just uh, in terms of materiality, but also in terms of uh, geometry. Um, the book also tries to look at modes of construction. The red uh, things are cranes here that like lay out uh, different radiuses and, and like uh, a different set of cranes necessary in order to um, uh, build and access uh, the project throughout uh, construction, not just through um, uh, triangulations uh, based on geometry, but also the making uh, of it. Um, I like that slide quite a bit for uh, a variety of uh, reasons. It was a photo that uh, um, doesn't look like that anymore. It was a photo one of my students took in uh, 2011. And um, if you look at the kind of like extreme like parametric care that is uh, given to uh, designing the project based on, on uh, creating not just like a particular geometric form, but then also how do you deal with uh, things that inevitably happen like um, um, imprecisions of construction. Uh, and then you kind of like see uh, um, different modes of, of, of uh, um, how things meet and what uh, also um, uh, kind of like the margins of error are uh, through very, very different lights. So the book doesn't try to kind of like uh, brush over those things and kind of like beautify um, um, like uh, um, acts of making and building, but kind of like highlights uh, what it oftentimes uh, take in order to make it work, um, such as uh, um, also quick looks at uh, zoning diagrams. This is, uh, again, uh, um, a kind of... Uh, very, very quick spread uh, of the Highline 23 building and what actually made the whole uh, building uh, work. Uh, as I mentioned, it's the only building, the first tower that actually came up uh, um, um, along the Highline, but it's uh, up to this point the only one that kind of like leans uh, into the Highline. And there were a couple of um, um, interesting moves that had to be made in order to uh, make this uh, work. It also looks at the making of it. I remember one of uh, Neil Denaris's ambition was to not have that kind of like east facing facade look as a kind of sleek metal facade, but very much like pick up on the kind of movement of plants and, and also that outlook onto um, the Hudson River. So it, it has these continuous uh, crinkles, uh, as he called it. This is a shot from factory in, in, in Buenos Aires where uh, those panels were um, produced, kind of really highlighting and, and like exaggerating um, 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 a very, very new uh, ornamentic, this, which was possible to uh, fabricate based on the mode of fabrication they have uh, used. This is an interior shot of the Kama Pinos project I mentioned earlier in Guadalajara, Mexico. It's a photo that always fascinated me because it's this kind of like view upwards. Uh, it's in fact like one high rise that has three towers, uh, almost like uh, wherever the towers meet, like a kind of our cartilage uh, at your knee, uh, it, uh, it inserts uh, the elevator. So there's no central core, but like there's decentralized um, um, cores. It allows, of course, for lights to come in in a very, very uh, different way. This was a series of uh, construction photos being kind of like spliced together. But you see that like there is uh, elevator staircases are uh, coming all around. Uh, but the lobbies are uh, yet again uh, decentralized. This is a um, construction shot of the slice porosity block where the light pavilion is based, kind of like looking from the interior outwards. Um, the project is shaped by uh, um, um, natural light or in fact like by light requirements for the surrounding uh, um, neighborhoods and buildings. It's a relatively 
um, to say the least, uh, big structure. So it, it kind of has a certain kind of presence um, um, also physically, but uh, um, certainly in terms of like how much light it kind of not only lets into the building, but also how much of a shadow it casts. So it's uh, um, um, cut open, sliced, that's where the name comes from, uh, in order to also um, minimize the way it positions itself uh, uh, structurally and uh, also in terms of uh, how it, how it uh, um, 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 tries to not cast as much of a, uh, a shadow. Um, this is uh, the chapter Roof Lines and Horizons. Uh, yet again, uh, the Guangzhou uh, Opera House uh, kind of, this is the detail I showed earlier that kind of looks relatively elegant here. It looks elegant because uh, of also its scale and size, which is what like the chapter wants to uh, address. But then it also um, um, reminds you through that overlaying. I don't do this all that often where drawings and like images are overlaid here. I thought it's kind of like helpful because it does show a kind of like lightness. At the same time, you're reminded that uh, this is actually like uh, four feet long and uh, there's quite some structural moves that are needed in order to, to uh, make this um, work. This was an uh, interview, one that I kind of uh, pointed out earlier with uh, Tom from Morphosis, who uh, kind of very interestingly uh, was asked, well, how many details or what details or do you, if any, uh, uh, details, uh, do you design them in situ, on site? Uh, um, do you, in other words, uh, troubleshoot? And his series of answers was uh, a really, really, um, really, really interesting and, and, and unexpected. There's a project that uh, runs parallel to the book, which is called uh, uh, Drawing a Thought. I'm part of like um, uh, 32 BNY uh, with uh, Stephen Hall, Dimitra Zachelia, uh, a variety of other uh, kind of like friends and members that over a couple of years uh, looked at uh, um, uh, around 40 archives uh, asking people like, what does a drawing do as a mode of like thinking or conceptual endeavor? Absolutely. That I make these drawings every day in the morning because, as you know, so it's a series of like um, uh, from, from waking up interviews uh, that kind of like now uh, are an ongoing uh, project uh, that run parallel to uh, the book. And a beautiful block of paper. He's always drawing, 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 drawing. It's the way he thinks. It's the way he argues points. You can see the buildings take shape. A visit to Oscar Nimas. This is the Beekman Tower uh, downtown. Um, so it doesn't necessarily try to be a counterposition to uh, the quote unquote like digitally designed or digitally invented, but very much like uh, um, challenge the open the question of like it being parallel. Uh, 25 years ago, I was a student. This was a conversation in Vienna in 99. The current mode of presentation was, would allow me to explore space in the way I can. This is really before computing was available to, to all of us. And the other thing was the idea of the projection, which I think became a very important, another, a very important component, that project, the projection of the drawing becomes the way it kind of start, the idea of kind of deformation, distortion, through projections allows you to look at the building in very different ways. So every time you look at the project, you look at it completely differently, and that really became a design process. So besides like, um, uh, the kind of like understanding of, of or, or the search for, well, what other modes of thinking do we have besides like drawing, projecting, scripting, uh, and, and parametric design? I started to look at uh, uh, like materials. Uh, the last chapter in Detail Culture looks at like uh, material questions. This is a, a shot. Uh, um, of uh, concrete in uh, nanoscale that like uh, became very, very interesting uh, in a way that the discourse in the office at that time, but then also in my studio started to like go back and forth between like, of course, like construction being uh, um, one that like doesn't always necessarily rely on construction documents, but also the desire of in fact, like constructing whatever um, 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 project or idea uh, you have in front of you. Um, this was probably very driven at that time by, this is a photo that uh, Ivan Ban shared with us for uh, um, the construction of uh, this slice porosity block and like the light pavilion. This is the foundation, first layer of foundations. And I, I've always been 
really fascinated by a uh, very, very different kind of uh, lines. Um, and those are lines of uh, rebars uh, that are woven uh, and become completely invisible at the moment. I am uh, at war concrete with my is poured over with it. History, with all authority that resides in fixed and frightened forms. This was also the time uh, we in the office, and uh, by we I uh, um, really kind of like very quickly stepping back, uh, um, um, 10 years uh, collaboration with uh, Levius Woods, where we for like sometimes like hours uh, throughout the day, like uh, um, talked about, looked at and thought about our construction, even though uh, um, as you may or may not know, a lot of projects uh, Lab was working on uh, had very, very little to do with uh, just the act of constructing, uh, but also kind of like discourses that very much like looked at like structures in a different way. This was a series of like projects that kind of like tried to rethink uh, structure uh, or columns. Uh, this is an essay uh, made out of uh, aluminum. Uh, the kind of like program was that we uh, plan to replace the, uh, the columns third floor lobby at the um, John Hayduk designed uh, Cooper Union building. Uh, this was, uh, um, um, there were two proposals that were then installed in front of like 7 East 7th Street. Uh, I know it's not necessarily an interaction with the public. Lifetimes that are as moments and forms that appear with infinite strength then melt into air. So it was the first time we became very interested in also the kind of like disappearance of, of uh, uh, material and the question of like, well, you know, buildings are very, very permanent. Installations are not all that permanent. Um, books are kind of a recording of uh, permanence, but like- what I am one of millions who do not fit in, who have no home, no family, no doctrine, nor firm place to call my own. No known beginning or end, no sacred and primordial site. So the interest uh, that, that uh, and, and like one of the focuses uh, in, and that's a shot of uh, the atelier was uh, lab working on uh, a project that uh, was very much kind of inspired and based on, on the proposal for uh, the World Trade Center at that time. Um, not necessarily only looking at, in fact, what I presented earlier with detailed culture, how does a building start and how does it begin, but also what is happening uh, in those uh, in-between spaces and conflict spaces that then uh, start to look at, well, you know, how do we activate our energies throughout uh, uh, the city uh, and uh, how do we in fact like uh, recognize the problems of a place, uh, whereas the biggest problem uh, a place can have is uh, not to have a problem, uh, which was very much that discussion that uh, um, um, happened in the atelier. We had a chance to work with Peter Nöber in the Museum of Applied Arts in uh, Vienna. On uh, that time for me, the first uh, performance. Tomorrow we begin together the construction of a city. So we were given a, a gallery space uh, and uh, um, uh, started to map uh, through a variety of different like uh, modes, drawing, music, performance, uh, um, um, analyzing uh, buildings throughout the historic district. Uh, and then a collaboration with Oleg Solimenko, who was by far not as famous as he has become in the last couple of years. He was somebody that was like, um, um, you know, just uh, really kind of like uh, uh, finishing a couple of his first uh, performances and plays. Um, but he was collaborating with us on uh, an installation that like, uh, was really a depository, uh, a kind of like drawing. Uh, Peter Cook called this at some point uh, a drawing you can uh, walk into. It was like a 5,000 square foot like, gallery space. It's a kind of like spatial drawing made of like, uh, um, 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 uh, cables, um, um, steel tubes, and to a certain degree en energy uh, vectors, which are those uh, aluminum pipes that could each one be uh, arranged in seven different uh, ways. They were uh, once a week uh, by 24 performers um, brought uh, into the city, um, interacted with a variety of different kind of historic contexts. Uh, this was a, a kind of like a, um, a mode of interaction with uh, Rachel Whiteread uh, on Judenplatz, a uh, Jewish monument, which is a cast of a library uh, from the inside out. There are sites that are uh, more ambiguous, less ambiguous, precise, interactive, non-interactive, contextual, conceptual, and then also like rely to uh, the kind of historic context uh, of, of uh, the city one of the inner kind of like fountains uh, um, in the 16th century. But like very much uh, um, I'm, I'm trying to uh, um, look at the moment and to a certain degree also uh, interact with uh, both the site and the um, uh, limitations of the site. So the importance here was like anonymity to a certain degree where uh, architecture always has not only an author but also a, a, a very, very uh, particular 
need um, uh, in terms of making it happen. It takes a lot of work, a lot of money, a lot of like hats and a lot of time. So we quite enjoyed that like moment of like uh, active energy, very much like uh, designing furniture, um, where you uh, very, very quickly see the results. Uh, uh, whereas in architecture, you have like a five, seven uh, year kind of like time span that like uh, goes through. So this was uh, the installation basically, or the kind of performances or the performers coming back uh, into the museum, dropping off uh, the energy vectors. And so the museum itself, the gallery itself really was, was kind of like a depository, uh, if you wish so. Naomi kindly mentioned Urban Hopes earlier in the Light Pavilion, and like I couldn't help to um, include um, um, a couple of slides to uh, trying to live up to 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 um, um, what you pointed out. The Light Pavilion was, as I mentioned earlier, kind of like an insert in larger uh, a project. Um, what was exciting about it is that it uh, doesn't uh, necessarily have a site other than it's sitting in a building. Uh, it doesn't have a program. It doesn't have a facade. Um, but it wants to be as uh, um, um, accessible and, and, and kind of as much of a kind of like meeting point as it possibly um, um, could uh, be within uh, that like really, really um, intensified um, moment. Um, it's... Uh, uh, the pavilion itself is set within uh, a more known three-dimensional geometry uh, that frames it. The light pavilion exerts the differences, most apparently the elements defining it to not follow them, rectilinear geometries of architectural uh, settings. The columns are supporting um, stairs throughout the project, viewing platforms, obeying geometry defined by dynamic movement. The deviation from the rectilinear grid releases um, from the static stability, it's set in motion, encountering visitors uh, to uh, explore. The interesting thing is that the project itself, even though it's uh, semi-transparent, uh, it's a project that uh, is probably the most permanent uh, in terms of uh, what we have uh, um, constructed uh, um, um, in a kind of uh, act of... of uh, really working uh, together and working together with SHA at that time. Uh, it's the only built work by uh, Lebius Woods in uh, 45 years of uh, uh, practice. And it was very, very interesting. You, you may know uh, another project he worked on as a, as a kind of like a uh, young professional, I guess is the right term, like just straight out of school, which is the TWA um, terminal. Um, so a lot of the things were interesting here because the details were really approached in, in a kind of like extremely meticulous way and probably differently than uh, we would have uh, uh, done otherwise. Um, the structural columns uh, articulate interior spaces that are illuminated from within the twilight and night hours visibly glow, creating a luminous space into which the solid architectural elements appear to merge. This quality is amplified by mirrored surfaces enclosing the pavilion, which visually extends its spaces infinitely. We might speculate this new type of space stands somewhere between traditional architectural and virtual environments of cyberspace, a domain we increasingly occupy in our homes and workplaces. But in the light pavilion, with more emphasis on the physical, than the mental and the virtual. From distances across the city, the pavilion is a beacon of light for the Ruffles city complex. From within the building, and especially from the large public plaza between them, the glowing structure radiates subtly, changing colors, symbolizing different holidays and times, each day, month, and year. The space has been designed to expand the scope of depth of our experiences. That's its sole purpose, its only function. If one needed to give a reason to skeptics for creating such experimental spaces in the context of this large urban development project, it would be this. Our rapidly changing world constantly confronts us with new challenges to our abilities and understands and acts, encourages us to encounter new dimensions and experiences. Um, this was part of a kind of like 2D to 4D series of works that has been created over um, um, many years in, in uh, the atelier, like the Light Pavilion uh, um, finished 2012. Um, I'm going to quickly go through also uh, a project that like uh, very much led up to it, an earthquake production system for uh, Reggio Calabria in uh, Italy. And I'm not going to speak about some of the projects uh, that were um, 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 kind of like listed right uh, before. I did want to, however, include uh, uh, a few shots that, in fact, were the last experience 
experience Labius had uh, um, with uh, the project. Uh, Ivan Ban just returning uh, from China, and uh, we're going through exactly that same sequence of shots. That's why I included them. Uh, and uh, Labius passed uh, two days uh, after. I am an architect, a constructor of worlds, a sensualist who worships the flesh, the melody, a silhouette against the darkening. So the project, of course, like changes throughout the day. It changes through a variety of different like holidays. I uh, I mentioned earlier that it is uh, built out of uh, entirely out of glass, uses exactly the same details, and this is why I think it was interesting that like Naomi included the project in in her introduction. The details for the stairs, the railings. Uh, the um, uh, the way uh, corners are constructed are exactly the same as in the light uh, in the slice porosity block uh, throughout, with the difference that it can adjust to its program based on uh, um, um, not only different holidays but different like moods that are um, um, created. Um, the facades is uh, initially were supposed to be or the surrounding. Enclosure initially was supposed to be a mirror um, for safety reasons. It uh, became uh, stainless polished um, um, steel, which has about like 98, in that case, a little bit less than 98 actually, um, um, percent of uh, reflectivity as uh, a mirror surface uh, would have. What's exciting about uh, the project, in my opinion, is that it is uh, not declared a lobby, uh, but like a public space, as you can imagine, and like I'm gonna, uh, Hopefully have, yeah, that's the shot I was looking for. It's the size of a four and a half story building, so it's not all that uh, small. It initially was supposed to um, um, kind of really go through the building, penetrate through the building, but uh, as so often, um, and even though we very much thought of it as a kind of like a semi-permanent uh, project and the kind of uh, maybe permanent uh, installation, it took quite a bit uh, to build it. Uh, so the budget or in order to kind of like make up for what uh, uh, finances were needed, it had to fulfill another purpose in addition to uh, being an installation. And uh, that purpose was that the project itself became uh, the, the, the kind of like main lighting fixture for uh, the uh, courtyard of the entire uh, slice process block uh, development. So that was like the main reason why we were able to uh, um, 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 work on the lighting design with Hervé Deco and uh, Le Observatoire at, at, at that time. Uh, it clearly taking every single uh, lighting uh, fixture, every single kind of like um, uh, um, um, dollar that was available uh, for public lighting and uh, it was kind of uh, expressed in uh, the light pavilion itself kind of like taking on that particular um, um, position uh, throughout. Anyway, um, to, to um, approach the end slowly, um, that very particular ambition of, of uh, light as a performance was then uh, uh, later translated into um, uh, the hub uh, for performer uh, that uh, um, Naomi um, pointed out was a kind of like a performing arts venue that uh, um, was created in 2015, uh, temporary space uh, in Tribeca um, for like 30,000 uh, people to come through within like a very, very short period of time. Uh, something that like needed to do uh, very, very, uh, um, like a lot uh, for very, very little. So there were a variety of different like modes of operations that we started to look at, like uh, the stage uh, uh, seating, um, the kind of like central element of like uh, not necessarily a theater, but like a, a performing space that like uh, used not just like the background as the foreground, but in fact the audience as the main um, um, attractions throughout. There's a couple of like uh, model shots. I'm just like quickly contextualizing this. We were very lucky to uh, um, um, produce this ourselves at the time uh, in in uh, our space in uh, Queens in collaboration with uh, Nick Carantinos and Tacit uh, uh, Creations uh, with uh, just like forward slash uh, um, most of the time works with a, a kind of like extremely interesting um, 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 set of uh, collaborators and uh, people we uh, worked with uh, in, in uh, uh, that kind of like project context. It took on many different shapes, many different forms, uh, based on also the performances, educational uh, readings, um, um, and like theater pieces, fashion pieces, uh, um, like uh, publication outlets that were um, um, positioned uh, in that particular um, venue. This is a quick um, run through in terms of uh, how it was uh, made and produced, uh, only to show that sometimes a drawing, I wanna go a bit further, um, a drawing can take on uh, um, 
very, very small shapes and very small forms, uh, as you know. Uh, you can come up with an incredible concept on like a 17 inch uh, screen uh, in your uh, kind of like Rhino platform. You can do it in your seven by 10 uh, inch uh, sketchbook. But like a very, very uh, small site in terms of like when you start working uh, of it can contain a big idea. Sometimes uh, if you have a very, very small pitch available that you start to work on, but you don't have an idea, it's a, it becomes relatively uh, big. Oftentimes the idea that you uh, have um, uh, doesn't take all that much. Uh, we here use like a hydraulic system to create that like platform that was both a stage, a table, um, uh, but then also a kind of like uh, meeting moment. Those were the first kind of like uh, frames for uh, the seating uh, that again all fit within like a 5,000 square foot uh, kind of storefront that was donated to um, a performer at uh, that time. So it's very interesting for us to kind of like think about uh, making in that context. I'm switching gears now a little bit. Uh, this is like uh, what, uh, again, I know we are like running late. I'm actually speaking tomorrow in Vienna, so I'm probably going to be late. But I can't help and share with you uh, the Extraction Laboratory, which is uh, um, um, our kind of like brand new endeavor at uh, Columbia GSUP, uh, something I'm very, very happy to, to uh, um, um, have kicked off uh, not that long ago. Uh, in fact, like just a year ago, where we look at very, very different modes of uh, kind of like uh, both representation and making. Uh, this was a kind of like endeavor that uh, happened only uh, two um, months ago, uh, where we looked at uh, gravity uh, as an architectural, like not even necessity, but like something we have to deal with. Uh, uh, everybody in uh, the studios uh, had three very, very precise um, uh, questions they had to answer. Design an archetype that uh, has to uh, either fly or fall in an elegant way uh, from 40 feet, fit within 12 by 12 by 12 inches uh, as a kind of like uh, outline, and at least weigh uh, one pound. Um, what was interesting is that uh, it's, it, it sounds relatively simple. It's a relatively, um, it's a relatively complex endeavor when you, uh, in fact, uh, start to incorporate uh, those parameters. But it also starts to look at like gravity and, and uh, the way we're in, uh, interacting with our environment in a very, very uh, different way. Environment and of course like uh, to produce a powerful failure is just as important as to uh, succeed uh, and we probably um, um, all have experienced this the one way or other. Of course like one of those things uh, um, that then like translated into a very different set of uh, uh, projects uh, uh, called like architecture and ecology, architecture and program was then what we took into a very different mode. It's a different outlet of uh, um, virtual Abelo visiting us from Off-White um, 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 just like uh, last year, which by the way, today just took over Balenciaga, um, uh, which kind of is one of the problems that, that uh, we have as architects. Uh, it, it, it like is a very, very long education, a very, very long and, and kind of like um, um, intense endeavor, whereas like um, 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 projects take even longer, right? Like a building five years, seven years. Whereas if you work in graphic design, if you work in fashion, if you work in any of the related uh, kind of uh, domains, if you wish so, you um, 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 get and create a project, maybe four of them uh, each year. It was very, very interesting um, kind of like um, question for us to ask. So I took the lab uh, with uh, Marisa Kefalidis, um, um, Dylan uh, Belfield uh, here in the back. Uh, I don't know whoever else is here from, from uh, the team to Black Rock City uh, in uh, the Nevada desert. And we looked at like eight different domes, uh, creating eight different environments, eight different types of shade, uh, kind of like uh, tried to and attempted to be as sustainable as possible through uh, saving and harvesting water, creating uh, uh, different modes of uh, transportation. Um, we looked at uh, um, um, vehicles and kind of like context and concept through uh, um, 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 the event. Uh, we uh, flew as a laboratory to Black Rock City, um, 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 kind of like very much like revisiting, not necessarily learning from Las Vegas, but like what can we take away from Las Vegas. We kind of like questioned um, 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 the event city uh, to use uh, Bernard's um, um, terminology here. And we kind of like um, um, started the construction of both uh, a camp and a roof that for two weeks became completely um, 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 like uh, sustainable off the grid, uh, looking at like modes of environment that sometimes change within like uh, 10 minutes. Um, 
It's like each day or each each other day uh, we were hit by a, a, a sandstorm that very much like changed, of course, not only the appearance of architecture but also the structural integrity of it. Um, this is one of my associates, uh, Aster. The person running around is uh, this is James Taylor Foster. He is the editor at large of uh, Arc Daily Europe, who was part uh, of it. Marcos Ariazzo is absent today, um, um, examining uh, ground conditions. Um, looking at uh, um, different ways of not only preserving uh, water, but to a certain degree kind of debarking from it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, like lines and details, um, 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 sometimes like in Performer, uh, they also did so in, in uh, our lab. We're focusing on an outlet uh, we thankfully uh, were able to uh, camp out at. This is the XDR Lab Northport uh, site where we kind of built the project, set it up before we then kind of like departed. Within uh, five days, uh, 75,000 people uh, move into Black Rock Desert with the understanding that everything uh, one brings in has to be also uh, taken uh, out again. Uh, there is uh, the famous daily MOOC runs, matter and material out of place, that very much becomes part of uh, a kind of like interaction uh, and statement towards uh, sustainability. The laboratory itself decided on that project for a variety of different uh, contexts to uh, research the state of affairs, futurity demanding uh, architectural thinking that is situational, responding in real time to conditional and urgent forces. Um, we examine situational logistics, uh, questioning the imperfection of objects. They make one-dimensional abstract ideas, downgrading dimensionality. We focus on situations as dynamic sets of conditions and intensified systems. We extract core samples of data, mediating the overloaded sensorial inputs. The laboratory operates in situ, creating recreational mixtures, immersive rapid fire, reactionary and reactive testing grounds. And we depart from the point of departure, seeking hyper-awareness phenomena, initiating stages of design and departures. At the extraction lab, we depart from the standard point of departure, seeking hyper-awareness phenomena, initiating state changes, implicating scale, yet scalelessness. Thank you very much. I unfortunately did not managed to uh, show you everything prepared. This was about like 60% of what, uh, what we wanted to look at. There are a couple of projects that I think would now um, go yet again back into the detail, but also the kind of deconstruction uh, of such. But uh, in order to not put everybody to sleep, I, I kind of thought that might be a good uh, ending point. If there is we are a small intimate crowd. If there are any questions, Naomi, how do you want to do it? Do you? Sure, sure. Um, we can also continue this, like you know, outside, inside, everywhere. Thank you for the extraordinary uh, lecture. It was very rich. Um, it's good to see um, what it is that you're integrating with your uh, research and your teaching. And um, it really does feel very much like a laboratory. Um, I'm just going to speak uh, to the book a little bit, a couple of questions. If it, any of you have seen the book, it's um, 
it's very thick, as he was saying. Thick book. Can't lift it with one hand. <laughs> so um, speaking of details, uh, I had a couple questions that came to mind um, your lecture. In, uh, you, you brought up Edward Ford's, I don't know if any of you know of Edward Ford's two-volume book, Details of Modern Architecture, that hasn't really been challenged that much up until today. Um, and Edward Ford says, uh, detailing was born when craftsmanship died. Um, so th the idea was that you know craft craftsmanship, when m people made things, there was the hand involved, there was error involved, there was there was the materiality that dictated how things would happen. And eventually, when we started to detail, we used to hide the joints between the roof and the wall and the wall and the floor. And we used to hide those imperfections and we created details. It's one example of them. So one of my questions, and you brought up that in the panel, in the example of the panel of the emission Im, errors or omissions or Im, Im, imperfections. Um, so I'm curious, in having done these case studies, uh, what, what do you think that the, the culture of craft is today, given? Um, I, I, uh... I think it's, it, I think we're in a very interesting moment in terms of not just like um, fabrication, which was very much part of the conversation, um, um, I would say not even just throughout the 90s, but like uh, probably up to like five, six years ago. Uh, you could hardly um, um, escape uh, a review, a kind of project meeting, uh, that didn't deal with uh, fabrication or is certainly uh, an obsession uh, of uh, fabrication. What we have been seeing in the last couple of uh, years is this like, incredible um, um, re-engagement with making, right? Like it, it, um, it's not necessarily focusing on on computation in fabrication anymore, but like very much in uh, in terms of like uh, details being not a necessary player, but like sometimes also the result of a very particular ambition. And we see this in the in the lab quite a bit, and certainly in uh, um, um, in the kind of like studios I'm involved with, where there's enormous amount of like making, enormous amount of like interest in uh, uh, materiality and materials, and uh, an enormous amount of kind of like also rethinking of like how like details uh, were achieved. So I like that you bring up the, the kind of like the one thing of like how to do a joint, right? Like, or the, 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 if you wanted to have a clean corner, like you very much knew how to do it. I was like speaking about the Neufert earlier today, and like some of you in the room probably remember it was that book where you kind of like were able to look up typologies, you know, you went into kind of like bathroom and you knew how big a bathroom is going to be and it's kind of like minimum um, 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 dimensions. It's not so clear anymore what what uh, um, I, I think like uh, um, a bathroom necessarily is or what like a corner needs to look like. And uh, it's a variety of really, really interesting um, 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 offices and like moments that engage with uh, like questioning uh, what a kind of like standard uh, uh, for an acceptable detail is. And in fact, like, whereas uh, it was much about uh, optimization, like during the time uh, um, um, we started to look at like architecture and, and, and kind of like the making of architecture. Now it, it, it uh, like optimization really took a kind of like a back seat. Uh, as long as you can count, you can make almost like everything in terms of uh, um, um, fabricating it. What became more interesting is that like the question of like why we make what we make um, 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 became part of uh, um, a larger context. With climate change being part of the conversation with uh, like the, the question of like uh, um, sustainability kind of like reaching towards like uh, um, where do I source our materials uh, all the way to the question of like where does the labor come from in terms of uh, um, what at the end of the day creates our buildings. So there's, there's I think, uh, uh, way more making uh, um, um, and thinking through making uh, and therefore also like making through thinking, which is probably something that would have been almost unthinkable to say a couple of years ago. I think like the field is way more open and like uh, people doing architecture uh, are kind of, you know, um, think about engineering the same way uh, as they think about uh, music or uh, um, graphic design or fashion or um, um, material science. Well, I think that's uh, important what, what you're bringing up and leads me to a second question is that um, historically the detail may have had ornamental qualities or narrative telling qualities or relating and referring to something other. And now with what you're bringing up, um, the detail has become in itself the form. And so where do you think that our aesthetics are going? I don't know. 
Um, I, 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 I like what you said before, the kind of a, a aesthetic and form question, because I, I also do believe, and one of the chapters that hasn't really made it in the book, but was certainly worked on, was uh, one along the line of like composites and components, right? Like uh, there's there's quite uh, interesting stuff happening in terms of like cooking, you know, um, materials and details together that become um, 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 buildings. And I'm not just speaking about like 3D printing, and I'm not just speaking about like um, um, fabrications and like. Uh, uh, maker ideologies. I'm really speaking about like uh, um, approaching architecture and like materials in architecture through a kind of biological lens, right? Where you can alter uh, concrete uh, on a nanoscale, or you can, in fact, like start to look at uh, fabrics and 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 uh, um, um, materials through uh, that particular uh, biological lens, and to a certain degree also like rethink the use of materials uh, that then can take many many different like um, 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 directions, can become site specific and therefore um, um, also material specific. In other words, uh, you can uh, today, and in Saha's case, it was very interesting with the Guangzhou. Uh, Browse, some of this really incredible chairs that would have taken 42 shipping containers to bring uh, just like the seating for the Oprah House uh, there, that could also be done in, in fact, like sending the files, um, buying uh, already uh, produced CNC equipment, uh, already in China produced CNC equipment, ship it to Guangzhou, and in fact, like use local labor, local material from maybe somewhere in the Guangdong area to produce exactly that same kind of like um, chair, or you can replace chair with any thing that you want. So in fact, like um, the, the question of the digital is an interesting one because it allows for uh, extremely local insertions uh, 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 the one way or other in terms of material sourcing, but then also in, 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 in terms of um, uh, making, right? Does this answer your question? Where does the aesthetic go uh, in that context? Well, there is a there is I think like a, a kind of attraction to to at the one hand side like the, the rough edge, the fuzzy detail, but then also the kind of cooked together and like seamless detail, kind of like the one on one uh, detail. I you know I. If, Anybody in that room that has ever sitten on been sitting on an airplane, right? Like probably engaged with like composite design uh, uh, more vividly than we uh, do as architects. You sit in a kind of broken down like uh, um, uh, yellow cap in New York. Uh, it's very very likely that it has leather seats that are heated and like your window moves up uh, um, with the kind of push of a button. There are very very few buildings that can do this uh, uh, these days. So I think there's a lot to do also technologically. Uh, at the same time, uh, that in itself uh, maybe should be moved into the category of like amenities that never made like a, a, a great project uh, all by itself. It like I think needs needs um, um, the different modes of engagement and like uh, the public material um, 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 kind of like a specificity through uh, a certain understanding of genericness is interesting, um, um, particularly in a place that is uh, um, like really rethinking or redefining what it means to be local or to work local, right? Like I, I don't know what that means in the context of New York, which is one of the most like global places. And then there's places that are extremely like locally oriented that work in a very, very global sense, right? And uh, it's not always technology, it's I think also the desire uh, for for like spatialization. It's one of the things why you see um, um, so many incredible, in my opinion, um, museum projects um, I'm, I'm, I'm growing out of uh, the ground in in uh, People's Republic of China. Um, 2000, uh, I know, 2015, uh, there were like, uh, I believe, 328 museums built, uh, which is like uh, almost a museum a day, uh, with a complete absence of uh, um, 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 collections and 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 like uh, artwork, which you could like see as horrifying at the one hand side, or like I really that keeps me up at night. I really I, I find this absolutely fascinating. Just imagine you have all those spaces that can be filled with like you know like ideas and like uh, uh, modes of thinking and like art and. Uh, it's kind of very encouraging, the one way or other, right? And that's what I think, like the point of like the kind of detail and like architecture, and then like all of us, architectural education is right. Like I, I uh, it's just like such an incredible moment of like uh, um, where we possibly could be going, and like what those different modes of of of, of outlets and operations are. Thank you. I just want to open up the questions to the students. Yes. See if uh, anybody had any questions. 
I will also be outside uh, in more one on one sex, one on one on one setting. Any question? Uh, what what role do you think mock-ups play in um, in the detail and what you were discovering? Pop-ups? No, mock-ups. Mock-ups. Um, <laughs> I think it has to do. Uh, I love the question. It has to do with um, has to do with scale. Um, I I do think. Um, I even though that's the safe answer, Mikael. Um, in terms of, uh, you could say, well, the smaller the project, the easier it is to to kind of create a mock-up. Even though uh, the larger the project, the more likely it is that you have the budget to to do so. Um, what I, maybe also going back to what Naomi was uh, hinting at earlier, uh, what I also like thinking about like architectural practice is that a lot of offices, a lot of like architects, a lot of like uh, students that are both, uh, they are designers, they are fabricators, they are, they are structural engineers all by itself. So there's a lot of, and I know in your own work, right? Like there's a lot of like design built work, right? Like where Absolutely. you're on site, mm -hmm. you make it, you detail it, there's an in situ component. So that sometimes, sometimes the mock-up uh, becomes the project itself. Um, I, one of the buildings that I uh, showed is the Demorphosis uh, uh, project, uh, which is uh, um, uh, um, has been very much relying on, on, on uh, mock-ups uh, for the detailing of it. In fact, like one of the answers Tom Main was providing in, in the Q and A was like uh, um, I asked like what was it, what's your favorite what's your most favorite like moment of, of of the Cooper Building or detail and he was talking about that kind of you know if you look at the facade like the paint uh, brushes or whatever appears to be paint brushes uh, um, on the kind of rain screen that's in fact like a perforated metal facade and like they had somebody from their LA office working in upstate New York for almost a year designing like those many many different like um, um, facade designs in collaboration with Desimon which is like a really interesting like facade consultant in in like they work globally in uh, like in the in the US but like uh, I think like California based I think the, the mock-up forces you as you probably saw in Burning Man mm -hmm. to deal with it right away yeah. it's not a pre-thought and it's not necessarily the generator but it's just all in ha it's all encompassing as you're in the moment of doing it and I think I think that the the testing that we're doing today as you mentioned about using technology has that capacity has that opportunity if you want to play with it yeah. right is i think that's what you were talking about and and i and i don't know if this was a, a intent a, a, in in intentional or if it was the generator but your installation slash performance of the metal tubes mm -hmm. and then the relationship to the light pavilion yeah. right you can kind of see that that's not necessarily, if I'm getting this correctly, is not necessarily the mock-up for it. But the, the ideas can translate and it's just a play of scale. So they can start to generate um, this kind of understanding of a performative detail that takes on another site, another host, another place. Is that correct? Absolutely. Anybody else? Questions? OK, let's all um, thank Christoph. Um, Thank you all for coming, and um, thank you to Marcella and Paola for helping organize this event, and please welcome outside for a short reception. Thank you.